Good morning. Good morning. Hi, I'm Dr. Felicia Chang. I'm from Setiawan Para. Today, I'd like to share with you my journey from being called a crippled to being addressed as an angel of death. I'd like to illustrate my journey in the concept of a box. So what is a box? A box is what a society expects us to behave, and in my context, as a cripple. Okay, what the society thinks it is best for us. Stepping out of the box means that the decision, the action that I've taken to overcome the boundaries that the society expects me to be, and staying out of the box, it is when I find the liberation and the freedom to do the things that I loved. In this society where everyone is looking for perfection, being born into, being born a cripple is deemed as a curse. It is a curse to oneself. It is a curse to the family. It is a curse to the society at large. And it is a curse to the nation. They thought, you know, what they mean is like, we will never do well in education. We are always asking for help. We will always have low self-esteem. And most of all, that we will not succeed in life. So this is me. I was actually born well, but contracted polio virus at the age of one. My right leg, as you see now, is shorter, smaller, weaker compared to my left. So I walk with the limb. At a very young age, as a very young uh, girl, I couldn't understand why was I so different. I look at my brothers and sisters and think, wow, they can dance, you know? They can swim. Wow, they can ride a bicycle. And because of my limb, I couldn't do it. So that makes me into a very timid and very scared little girl, right? I do not have a lot of uh, self-confidence, very, very low self-esteem. But I was growing up into adolescent. This thing that the society put into me kept growing. And I always felt that I'm not good enough for anybody. There may, someone, there may be someone that I really admire, but I will never have the guts to tell him that I like him because I always thought that I was never good enough. But as I was growing up, I want change. I just. I don't want to uh, be in that situation anymore. I want to big, dream big dreams. I wanted to do great things. So I made a conscious decision and said, look, Felicia, you need to make steps to come out of this box. And I made a conscious choice of becoming a doctor. The people around me was like, are you crazy? How can a cripple be a doctor? How can you save life? And but at that time, I tell myself, why not? Why must I be confined with what the society tells me? So I decided to go to India to do my medical. Please bear in mind, when you make a decision to change, it is not an easy one. It wasn't easy for me at all. Let me share with you what happened in India. In India, at those times, we have always have power failure. So my class is five floors up. There are days that when there's power failure, the lift doesn't work. So I have to climb five floors up to attend a class. It was so hard, it was so painful, but I know I already made that determination. I'm going to be a doctor, so I'm going to do it. So although it is very hard, but the rewards are extremely sweet. The day that I went up the stage to collect my medical degree, Everyone stood up and clapped, and that was my proudest moment for the decision that I've made to become a doctor is being realized. Tell you the truth, it has never been easy. But you must remember, in all that we do, as long as we have a focus, then we work towards our dreams. From there on, nothing stops me. I continued to do things that other people refused to do. I went to Perhentian and got my party certification for diving. I went to Australia to jump off a plane. Believe me, I'll never do that again. <laughs> it's a bit scary. I chose to contribute back to the society. 
I fundraised for children with cancer. I fundraised for Orang Asli. I fundraised for people that need money. And that kept me going. And in all this, my parents, my family, my friends has been extremely encouraging. They have seen a change from somebody who is so timid to become somebody who is contributing. So they continue to encourage me even up to today. Stepping out of the box is just halfway. Staying out of the box is extremely hard as well. The reason is because I, we can easily be pulled back into the box. For example, we do not have policy that help us in employment. A lot of my friends are still unemployed. There's no, uh, what they call that, uh, there's a lot of discrimination against us. And simple thing like uh, OKU parking or OKU toilet, they're being abused every day. So sometimes you do feel low. But when I go home and think about it, I tell myself, it's okay, Felicia. Let's just, that's how things are. We just need to be strong. So with prayers, with the support from my loved one, I continue to make decisions every morning and say, no, I'm not going to let the society determine where I'm going. This is my life, and I'm going to live it. Angel of Death, how did I get this name? Okay, a friend jokingly tell me many years ago, you know what, Everyone, you, every patient that you touch, they died. So I think you're the angel of death. Well, that's better than touch and go. You know, I touch, they go. <laughs> so yes, that's how I got my name. You must be wondering, what kind of doctor is this? Why is it that every patient that she touched dies? Well, the fact that I'm a palliative care physician means traditionally, a uh, patient who are dying comes to us. When all the doctors say that, look, I can't do much for you now. Please go to palliative care. So we are the group of people who help our patient and the family prepare for the last six months of their life. So when they come to us, we give them pain control, we give them counseling, we make sure that they, they settle their unfinished business, and we make sure that when they die, they die in a dignified and peaceful way. So that is palliative care. Why, Felicia, do you choose such a cold and moderate career? Every single day you see death. To be very honest, the career chose me. Believe me, I tried to run away many, many times. I even ran to Chiang Mai to, to, see, to, to want to avoid continuing my, care, my career. But God keep calling me back. So it became my calling. It became a platform where I serve my God, where I serve the people in need. It must be depressing. I agree and disagree at the same time. I agree because when you see a patient on a day-to-day -day basis, you build relationship, you build a friendship, and when they die, you feel hurt. And when that happened in a week, maybe I lost three of my patients in a week, it can be very overwhelming. But those are far in between. What you didn't see is the joy that I see in my patient the smile that they gave me when the pain is controlled. When certain issues at home are being solved because I help to facilitate the thankful face that they come to me and say thank you. Or when they died peacefully. Those are the catalysts for, to do what I do. Because I know with me and with my team, when we intervene and we help, my patients are able to die in a dignified and peaceful manner. But self-care is extremely important. Emotional thermometer. We know when we are going to burn out. Before we reach that stage, we must know how to take care of our, our, ourselves. So when I feel that I just can't think properly anymore, or my nurse starts to tell me that, Dr. Felicia, I think you are reaching that point, I'll take time off. I'll take a few days off, I'll take a few weeks off, so that it gives me some time to do, to rest, to have some self-reflection, to then recharge myself so that I can take care of my patient in the future. These are some of the lessons that I learned from my patient. Do you know the best teacher is my patients? And I'd like to share stories with you, with each one of them. I have a very young man 
I think she, I think he was in his 20s. And I gave him about six weeks before he would die. One day he took, he, he, he took me to, uh, by the side and said, Doc, what is the priority in your life? I was like a super doctor trying to impress him. I said, you know what? I want to be the best doctor for you. He was like, wrong priority. He said, you should prioritize family and relationship. When you're on bed waiting for your time to come, nothing is more important than your family. From him, I learned that my priority should be building relationship with the people that I love, with my God. Communication. My 50-year-old patient, he was a CEO of a public listed company. Okay. He told me, Doc, you know what? Cancer was the best thing that can ever happen to me. I was like, huh? I said, must be brain meds. But he was saying, you know what? When I was younger, I worked so hard. I, I, I didn't see my children growing up. And when I was sick, I don't know how to talk to them. We may be sitting in, on the same table, but I do not know how to talk to them. So from him, I learned that you need to make effort to communicate with the people that you love, with your friends. I could have used my excuse and said, I'm a busy doctor, I don't want to meet my friends, but I make conscious effort to meet them every month so that I want to maintain that relationship. Never give up. Is life hard for you in campus? Is life hard for me? It is. We struggle different way. But my patient, even though they know that they only have weeks to go, they never gave up life. Yes, treatment may have failed, but the laugh, the joy, the joke, they tell me about stories, they have never given up life. And what right do we have when we are well, when we have a dream, and we gave them up, even though it is hard, don't give up your dreams. Simplicity is beautiful. In my patient's world, it is about drugs, it is about symptoms, it is about tiredness, it is about frustration. But one of my patients told me, Every morning when you do work rounds and when you touch my hand, all this goes away. A simple touch can help my patient to overcome that day. So sometimes, even on the busiest day, I would just like to have a quiet, simple moment in the morning with my cup of coffee. And I can have the courage, the strength to move on for the rest of the day. I used to visit a patient uh, in, she stays in a, in a wooden house, very poor in a slum area. Yes, KL, we still have a lot of slum areas around us. And every time I see her, she will send the son to buy me coal 100 plus. It may not be a lot to us, a couple of ringgit. But to that family, it is one meal. And yet, she showed me the generosity. I learned that we can be generous in our time, in our effort, in donation, just to help the next one that you need. And I think this is the most important lesson that I've learned from my four-year-old child. My four-year-old girl has a very rare cancer. It's very, very rare. But whenever I visit her, she, she usually she'll be in pain. The mom will call me and say, you know, she's in pain, but she's asking for you. So I'll go to the house. The moment I reach the door, she will run to me and say, J -j -j -j, let's play with my Barbie doll. And I was like, hmm, I thought the mom just told me she's in pain. So when I was playing with her, I realized that it distracted her. She was having fun, even though she was having a lot of pain. So what I learned from my child is that even though life is tough, life is hard, you can still have fun. I'd like to share with you a story. Was what happened last week. In fact, what happened this, this week. 
So this is about palliative care and how important it is. Okay. I have a 39-year-old gentleman who has cancer of the bowel duct. And I was seeing him in the ward. And he was like, Felicia, you must promise me that you will not prolong my life. When the time for me to go, let me go. I was like, sure. So two days later, he developed severe complication. And the sister said, no, we have to send him to ICU. And he, there he goes, went to ICU. And the sister said, we don't want Dr. Felicia to come in anymore because she's just going to let him die. So because it is a patient, a family's decision, I couldn't see my patient. But I was seeing another patient in the, in the ICU. So when the sisters are not around, when the wife is not around, the patient saw me and insisted that the, the nurse to call me into his room. So there I went. He looked at me and said, what did you promise me? You promised me that you will not prolong my suffering. So I have a choice to follow what he wants or follow what the family wants. But my duty of care is always towards my patient. So I need to fight doctors. I need to fight family. It was not a very pleasant environment because you know, when someone is dying and you're telling the family that, you know, let him go. It wasn't easy for the family. And yet, I make my stand because that is a promise that I gave to my patient. We had a lot of arguments. We had, we had a lot of shouting matches. But finally, the wife agrees that he was suffering too long and it's time to let him go. So at the end, when my nurses told me when he passed away, he passed away with a smile. So... What I want to say is palliative care is extremely important. And from my position as a cripple to the, this journey to become who I am today, it wasn't easy. Seriously, it was tough. But if we make conscious choices every single day to do better, if we make conscious choice not to fall back into the box, okay, we can do it. With hard work, with tenacity, with persistence, I believe every one of us have the potential to reach and achieve our dreams. I hope the next round, instead of addressing me as the angel of death, I would like to call the healing angel. With that, I thank you for your kind attention. Have a blessed day. God bless.